Um, what you just saw in the last two talks is really pretty incredible. Well, when you think about how the field has moved and how people sitting here at the stage have really helped to move it, um, we know from seeing our patients what the clinical needs are. We have patients all the time who are really undertreated, not well controlled. And we knew that there was a big impact because if you spoke to your families, you could find it out. But you're seeing there's a lot of work being done. I mean, Jonathan just went through this incredible amount of work with, with his name and Eric's name on a lot of the slides, really documenting the impact of, uh, of, of eczema on individuals and the family. And, and Emma obviously has done work that really translates as we get to, into our therapies, into understanding about ways to uh, uh, move us forward. So it, it's, um, it's a, a great to have the panel here, but just realize how the field is really shifting. So I'm gonna discuss, now we're starting the therapy part of the, uh, of the talk, and I'm gonna be discussing topical therapies. I've served as a consultant or investigator for uh, most of the companies in atopic dermatitis. Uh, my discussion will be evidence-based and based on published uh, papers or papers that have at least been um, scientifically vetted in, in poster format. So before I get to the new topical therapy studies, I just wanted to highlight a totally different end of the equation that we don't have a lot of time to discuss today, but it's partially in the onset of atopic dermatitis can we do stuff to prevent it? And can we do stuff to understand, for instance, what's happening in terms of the change in microbiome on the skin? So start with the prevention studies. And these studies were, were, have been out for a few years, and they're really two paired studies, the US-UK study that Eric was the lead on, and then a Japanese study. And basically, these were like preliminary studies of a small number of, of, uh, of infants who were prospectively given a moisturizer, really to see if it was feasible to do the study going forward. I think Eric just put in a massive grant that hopefully will get scored well um, to do a real big, bigger study to see whether early intervention can prevent atopic dermatitis. And hit, in this study, when they looked at the data, it was about a 50% risk using a variety of a different emollients that were different in the, in the US and in the UK. And around the same time, there was a study out of Japan that was uh, um, um, different in design in that they took uh, uh, um, um, infants who either had siblings or a parent with atopic dermatitis, and they did a specific emulsion type moisturizer and did pretty rigorous criteria for the uh, diagnosis of emergent atopic dermatitis and found about a 32% decrease in, a, in a, um, development of atopic dermatitis in this high risk group, but interestingly, no impact on the development of IgE sensitization. One of our questions that we have is when you have an infant with, with, who has dry skin cirrhosis barrier dysfunction, is what's happening to them an exposure uh, and exposure to antigens and allergens, et cetera, is something that sets up the immunology that Emma so you know, carefully showed you is happening in terms of the sensitization. So in this case, it was interesting that they didn't have an impact on IgE rates, but they did have a decrease in atopic dermatitis. Now, there was just an article a few months ago that got a lot of interesting lay press that Jonathan was part of, where they took these two studies and said, okay, well, like, if we did this and it worked, and we intervened, would it be cost effective to do it, okay? So can you get these happy babies with prevention? It happens to be a Japanese baby, but okay. So, but which moisturizer is the question? So this was a study that was published in JAMA P. It's got a lot of late press. And essentially, it, uh, in the late press, it made it, it made you, if you read it, you made you, th made you think that there were these massive studies that were done, but they were. What they did is they took those two studies and said, okay, like, let's say we smeared up a bunch of kids and we smeared them up with different things. How much would it cost to do that prevention that would it be cost effective? So basically they took, they took the data on the cost of seven common products, ranging from petrolatum, I have the list on the next slide, and they assumed that if you did that on babies, um, um, you would get a 50% reduction in the development of atopic dermatitis, which is based on Eric's study, not the other study, and then figured out what the QALY, the quality adjusted life year impact would be. So, so quality is like Bitcoin for health economists. Okay, it's the, it's the, the number they use to assess the, 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 the cost value of doing an intervention on the lives of the individual. And they also assume, very importantly, they also assumed they assumed equal efficacy 
in all of the moisturizers that were used. So there's these huge assumptions, both that you're going to prevent stuff by 50% and equal efficacy. But of course, they showed that there, what they showed is that there was a huge difference in the cost intervention because the variation from use of petrolatum as compared to some very elegant formulas that have been designed to put stuff back in the skin that's missing would have a huge difference in terms of the cost. And pretty much no matter which cost value you went to, it was cost effective <laughs> because the intervention of decreasing atopic dermatitis would have a profound effect on those individuals. So, it's very interesting because when Eric speaks on this, he says it's sort of not ready for prime time and he doesn't recommend moisturizers necessarily for all of, uh, uh, all of infants at risk. I've started to do it more regularly, even though the science basis is, you know, we'll have, we, we need more data, but, but interesting studies. Okay, let's move over to phosphodiesterase. So we saw at the beginning of the week, actually, the first talk discussed about topical PDE4 inhibitors, but I wanted to, you know, we're doing the, the spectrum of topical care. So like many things, great observations are, are made, and it takes sometimes decades for people to translate those to clinical practice. So John Hannafin showed about 30 years ago that in circulating immune cells in atopic dermatitis, as well as in asthma, that there was increased uh, phosphodiesterase activity, particularly PDE4, that that correlated with decreased cyclic AMP in cells, and raised the question of whether PDE inhibition could increase cyclic AMP levels and decrease cytokine and mediator release. And you've seen there's a variety of different diagrams that we have that talk about in atopic dermatitis, overactive PDE4, cytokine release, and then whether if you can block PDE4, um, uh, you can decrease the, uh, the cytokines. And we know that that's translated to the first topical PDE4 uh, that we've had out for, um, uh, you know, approved and, and getting into people's hands uh, uh, now. Boron-based technology, which is uh, done to uh, uh, facilitate its stability and uh, binding capacity. So I, I didn't want to just go to the phase three studies, but realize as a new chemical entity, there had to be work to be done. And it, since a lot of this, a lot of the studies were done in kids, I thought we'd just quickly go through them. So Winnis Tom was first author on a, a PK study, it was an open label phase 2A study in 12 to 17 year olds, showing very little serum absorption. So we know we have one PDE4 that we use for psoriasis. It's not the same PDE4, but there's low levels of serum levels of the topical PDE4. DE4 in uh, chrysoboral 2% ointment. They actually, in, the, in a maximal use study um, that was done in adolescents, they had pretty good clinical results with about 40, almost 50% of patients making it clear to almost clear in open label studies. And then the phase three studies were already published in the JAD uh, prior to the release of the drug. So very quickly, just I want, want to tell you that there's two sets of studies that were done together. There was the, the phase three paired studies, and that's the one that went for approval. And then there was a long-term safety study that you haven't seen published yet, but the data has been shown in posters, so hopefully to be published soon. So you've already seen the data on the, the first phase, which is the, the two parallel studies done in multiple centers, about 1,500 patients with atopic dermatitis, age two and older. There haven't been patients under two treated with this drug. It's two or older. Uh, clinic, uh, they had to have a mild to moderate atopic dermatitis, minimum 5% body surface area, and that was a 28-day study. And at the conclusion, those patients were rolled over, at least the first, about 500-something of them were rolled over into an open label where they all got access to the chrysoboral. Now, some of those patients, about a third of them, hadn't had chrysoboral yet because they were on vehicle and the others had been on chrysoboral and they remained on it. And the design was pretty interesting because the way it went is the patient was looked at at the beginning of the month and if they had active eczema, uh, anything um, uh, uh, other than almost clear, they were given the chrysoboral to use twice a day for that month. And then if they were clear, they were told, don't do anything, let us know if you flare in the meantime. And then people came back a, a month later and were given the drug again if they had a, a, a global score of a, of, of a greater than one. So a reevaluation every month in a therapy, and it was a, a one-year study, and most of the patients basically had at least six months of therapy up to one year. Once they got to a certain number, they hit one year, they said, okay, that's enough, and the, and the study was stopped at that point. So 
The primary endpoint, you've seen this data earlier this week, um, they made the statistical significance of patients who were clear and almost clear as compared to vehicle. It is a petrol on a moisturizing vehicle. Pretty good vehicle response in the study that happens in these, but made the statistical significance. And then the clear or almost clear without the two-step in IgA was around the 50% standpoint. And earlier in the week, you know, Ted Rosen was trying to compare this with, the, with other studies. It is important to know the population studied, so you can get a sense as you start to use it in practice, who were the patients who were studied. So patients were officially, by the IgA, two-thirds of them were moderate. The average body surface area was actually about 18 percent. They only needed to have, you know, 5 percent, but it was about 18 percent. And they had a mixed level of baseline pruritus, with about a third of them having severe pr pruritus and about a third with moderate pruritus and about 25% who had mild pruritus at the time. So in, if you do a composites of the patients who made it to clear or almost clear, meaning the two studies together, you're at about 15% um, as compared to about 38% in the vehicle group. At the recent AAD, there were uh, another study was showing, actually another cut of the study was looking at pruritus and the speed of pruritus. I think Emma was actually first author on, the, on this poster that showed that, that at 48 hours, they had about 34% of patients who had at least a, sort of a two-level change in their pruritus or made it down to minimal pruritus, about 27% in the vehicle group. And by day six, that goes up to 56% as well. Um, the long-term safety study, one of the things I like about the one-year study is that the average use was actually pretty high. So when I'm looking at the relative safety, because this drug is new, so basically one year is about the extent of the, the use data that we have. Um, if you look at the 2 to 11 year olds, there's about 800 grams and you figure about, you know, they were on average, they were about 8 to 12 months on the study. So the, the study re is representing 50 to 60 grams a month of use and that they had really good safety with that. That quantity of use makes me much more comfortable with the drug as we're trying to figure out how it fits in practice. The treatment immersion adverse events data looked rather, uh, rather banal. There were some, about 11% of patients who had some flares of dermatitis that was recorded as a, a, a emergent adverse event, and then upper respiratory effect and nasopharyngitis. Remember, this is an uncontrolled one-year extension, so that's not a very high rate uh, during the course. And if you look at the topical effects, you see a little bit of flaring of atopic dermatitis, uh, and this is in the subgroups um, in terms of the younger age, not really much different than the, than the adults, and a little bit of application site pain with less than 4% having what was recalled, caused a stinging or burning. Remember, this is not a steroid. As a non-steroid, there is no evidence of atrophy or telangiectasia in any of, the, any of the studies. Now, what we don't know, so easy scores or score ads weren't done, so I can't tell you about regional effects, for instance, on the face. So there is neither head-to-head -head or face-to-body comparisons in the studies, uh, um, and there weren't um, cost efficiency, something we'll need to, uh, uh, to uh, figure out. It has not been studied under H2, though it will be, and we don't really have long-term safety beyond a year. We do have oral PDE4s, but that, you know, it's not necessarily the same thing. Now, one of the interesting things, and usually I don't show prescribing information and brand name, but it's just, you know, there's a new drug, we just got it in our hands, and I get a lot of questions about, well, how are you going to use it in practice? And we'll see if we have time in the panel, we probably won't, <laughs> to discuss how we use it. But the indications, actually, speaking to the company people, they didn't really quite get it, that they got really, really liberal indications in terms of what it states in the prescribing information, because the prescribing information essentially says, it's approved for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis ages two and older, and how do you use it? It says, you know, apply a thin layer twice a day. And there is this handout that comes to the patient. So when I'm asked, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you use it? You know, what, you know, how do you use it in practice? I think it's great because the prescribing information for the, you know, it goes to the family said, how should I use your CRISA? And it says, use your CRISA exactly as your healthcare provider tells you to use it. <laughs> So, okay. so, uh, so there's really no, even though this, it was studied for 28 days with one year of safety, there's no duration limitation. But in real clinical practice, it's going to be the usual set of issues of can you get it for your patients, can you get it for access, how do you place it in relationship to your, your standard topical interventions, your good general skin care, your topical corticosteroids, and or if patients have persistent, more frequent clearing disease, what do you need to do to get beyond just the mix of topical agents? 
There are other PDE4s in development, Atsuka's uh, product, which will continue in Japan, and Medimetrics, that product uh, is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the U.S., Medimetrics has picked up that product, so it has two different names, OPA15406 and MM36, and Royvant also has a PDE4. It is unknown if the selectivity of binding of different PDE4s will translate to different efficacy in practice. It's like a nerdy question. People will come running up to me and say, hey, you know, how, what do you think of the different selectivity of PDE4s and how are you going to predict which <laughs> one's going to do better? Exactly. So Andrew's laughing. That's the I have no idea at all, but it's going to be something that we really will figure out over time. So the, one of the studies has made it through phase twos and was published in the, in the JAD, and there are ongoing two phase three trials of other topical PDE4s. Now, for people People who are nerds in the field of topicals in atopic dermatitis, just let you know about other stuff that's happening. Uh, GSK has picked up a, 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 a and working with a, a, a topical product that uh, that they figured out is a aralene hydrocarbon receptor, which I guess is it really Emma. It, it sort of it targets you think. TH22 is a, um, and um, and so it has it has. Uh, impacts in, in, um, as an anti-inflammatory. And it's really interesting because this was a, this was a, the, um, this was an older drug that was done and did studies in Canada about five years ago. It got picked up again. Um, the drug was actually presented in poster format for psoriasis in adults with mild to moderate psoriasis showing, showing efficacy. So this is a psoriasis study, but the drug is also being studied in atopic dermatitis. And, um, and what its um, um, mechanism of action relates to this um, uh, TH2 cytokine reduction. Um, and in the poster that was presented at the AAD, they were looking at atopic dermatitis, 15 to 30%, 35% body surface area. It was a small, small PK study. And they all did, they all did pretty well with the uh, easy scores. Uh, although the higher dose, there's some problem with headache, diarrhea, and nausea. So they probably won't be using that formulation going forward, but it'll be interesting to see how this fits in the armatarium of therapy. Topical JAK inhibitors are being developed. There was an excellent paper by Bissonnette and colleagues showing efficacy uh, uh, with tofacitinib. They've decided not to go forward with topical tofacitinib, but I do believe that topical JAK inhibitors are going to be in the future of atopic dermatitis. Lastly, an absolutely elegant paper done by Rich Gallo and colleagues at, at UCSD, uh, which I sort of summarize as, can we do probiotic application on the skin? But basically, this was really, um, this was really superb translational research where, where uh, 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 Teru Nakatsuji and, and Rich Gallo's group essentially found that on skin in atopic dermatitis uh, patients, there's, of course, decreased expression of antimicrobial peptides, but also a loss of certain um, staph. And if in patients without atopic dermatitis, there is a set of staph species that kill off staph aureus. So if you don't have atopic dermatitis, you have these staph species on you. They secrete a factor that's been called hogocytin, which kills off staph aureus. And they've shown that that's present and that it's decreased in patients with atopic dermatitis. They actually cultured patients with atopic dermatitis, found their subsets of bacteria that produce this anti-staph factor, cultured them up, and then transplanted them on, back onto their skin and showed that it was effective at decreasing the staph aureus in the skin. So this is, you know, a fascinating perspective on how change in microbiome happens with the disease process, can we s essentially select out uh, bacteria? Now, whether this will impact on, on the atopic dermatitis over time, whether this is something that we can do earlier on in the, in the ontogeny of development, it will be really, really intriguing. Lastly, I have, don't have time to discuss new devices, stylized barrier repair uh, agents, or new aspects of moisturizers, the encouraging safety data that's come with the registry studies with the calcineurin inhibitors, but all of those are part of topical therapy. So in summary, the, we have the new knowledge of both the pathogenesis and the impact of atopic dermatitis. We have a newly approved PDE4. Our messaging in the areas of topical goes along with systemic, that we have new ways to manage our disease, and we really want the patients to understand the hope that they should walk around with less eczema. Thank you very much.